So thank you uh, to everyone for uh, coming to our last uh, big data genomics biology medicine seminar series. Uh, I think we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Eric Topol join us for this final, uh, final talk of the year. Uh, so Eric is a pretty amazing guy with a, a history almost like living many multiple lives in uh, one lifetime uh, from you know, more than 1,000 uh, papers published, which should be a good benchmark for anyone here to try to beat. Uh, super influential in the clinical trial arena and engaging uh, the pharmaceutical industry and helping get uh, therapeutics uh, into the market, but then also not uh, sort of selling his soul either to that, uh, that pipeline and uh, was you know, among the first, I think if not the first, uh, to sort of raise the uh, specter of Vioxx uh, having cardiovascular uh, adverse events, and so uh, was heavily involved in that whole arena. Uh, so a, a storied uh, cardiologist, geneticist, who made really fundamental uh, discoveries, uh, but then uh, took off from the Midwest and headed west uh, to Scripps, where he uh, set up uh, and directs the uh, Scripps uh, Translational uh, Medical Institute, Health Institute. Uh, and really driving, I think, the, the main pioneer of, you know, what is this next generation of medicine uh, going to look like? How are we going to better enable characterizations around uh, patients that don't have to take place in the medical center but can leverage the vast sea of technology that's uh, sort of bubbling out uh, from many different areas, but not just waiting for that technology to bubble out. He also is actively involved in developing and testing the technology uh, that can ultimately uh, be used by individuals to sort of, you know to understand your your health right from your your iPhone or sitting uh, inside of your home. So it's uh, really driven uh, amazing uh, amounts of uh, work uh, geared towards that and kind of inspired a lot of uh, what uh, I've uh, tried to uh, push here, uh, certainly with many of you on you know how we can help engage, embrace the kind of digital revolution that Eric is uh, uh, leading to you know, do better for the, for the patients at Mount Sinai and ultimately to cast the, uh, the net beyond Mount Sinai into the more well population that's not necessarily coming uh, into the hospital to get fixed, but if we can better understand their conditions and their health, we can maybe better advise and better manage their conditions. So I think it's the kind of thinking uh, that's just ingrained in Eric and what he's been uh, doing that uh, I'm really very much looking forward to uh, what he has to say along those lines and how we can uh, uh, engage in that uh, work as well. And then I'll just make a quick comment when we morph into the question and answer, if people can please use the microphones uh, to ask the questions. Uh, that would uh, you know, basically help everybody because we're uh, this is being videoed and uh, broadcast online and, and those who are tuning in via the web need to hear that. So without further ado, I welcome uh, Eric Tolp. Thank you. Well, it's really great to be with you today, and uh, I want to apologize for being overdressed. I left my cargo shorts back at home, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm one of Eric's biggest fans, and it's fun to be here at Mount Sinai and see my old friend Valentin Fuster and, uh, and so many others here. So uh, before I get started, I was asked to um, mention that the hashtag for the meeting um, is GBDM for Genomics, Big Data, and Medicine, and uh, I guess my first question to ask because of that kind of Twitter intro, how many of you here are active on Twitter? Okay, not enough, a very small fraction. Um, I think if we all were active, including Eric, <laughs> we would actually have, uh, uh, we'd get smarter faster because that's sharing information. So um, I wanted you just to note, I, I kind of was thinking about this the other day, is that all the genes that are active now medically have hashtags. And I was starting to think, well, maybe um, when these genes were named, they were ready, for all Twitter ready. You know, they're <laughs> kind of amazing. They have names that are just perfect for Twitter. For Twitter. So uh, let's start off with the technology side, because this is just astounding how we are in this accelerated phase of technology. Um, if you go back to electricity, in the 1870s, it took 46 years 
for a fourth of Americans to adopt electricity. And then if you go fast forward where Moore's Law is starting 50 years ago, you see that mobile phones, it took 13 years. And now for a fourth of Americans to use a new technology for smartphones, it took only two years. So outside of the medical domain, things are moving very quickly uh, with technology. And I think a lot of people don't really get, capture the Moore's Law power as to what it really means with respect to how many transistors are in a chip. So this is just the last decade, and we're now getting to the point where it's uh, 19 million uh, transistors in a 16 nanometer chip. So how many uh, transistors are in a current iPhone, uh, a Galaxy phone? Anybody? You, you must know that. Anybody? Just a guess. Come on. I, are you too busy tweeting, or you know, what is it? <laughs> No one will even take a guess how many transistors in a smartphone? Nobody. Four billion? Four billion? Okay, it's two billion, a little over two billion. That's pretty impressive to me, I, I think. Okay, so that has created a new species of man, Homo distractus, uh, because <laughs> the flip side of all this technology and its acceleration is that we're fixated to our technology and we have multiple screens at any given time, and so this has led to this, uh, this problem. And you can see it here, uh, you know, this is a New Yorker. And, uh, you know, this is a real problem. This, uh, there's a low-tech uh, uh, solution to this, it's pictured here, keeps me from looking at my phone every two seconds. Um, it's an old veterinary approach, and actually this one is my favorite here. Um, the, uh, he looks so natural. <laughs> uh, so that's a little background that there are some downsides to this technology, this mobile device mania with a digital infrastructure that's so rich with cloud and supercomputing and pervasive connectivity and broadband. So there's a lot there. Uh, but what it's going to do is take us from this population level medicine that we're at today still to uh, in and that's what's so exciting, and we're just starting to make that pivot right now. So uh, I want to go through imprecise medicine, which is exemplified by this recent nature uh, uh, commentary. And so in red, for the top 10 uh, medications by gross sales, uh, in red are the people who don't respond, and in blue are the responders. And I hope you get a sense pretty quickly looking at this picture that for the top 10 drugs, not that many people actually clinically respond. That's really pretty imprecise. That's population level medicine. And if you actually take that another level, which is what is the economic impact of this imprecision, you see a profound amount of waste. What you see just tallying this up of these top 10 drugs, you see that 79% are, uh, are non-responders which is a profound amount of waste. So that's just on the medication side. Then let's talk about mass screening, like mammography, the prototypic mass screening. The false positive rate for mammograms in the only group of women who are now supported by the U.S. Prevention Task Force to have a mammogram, 50 to 74. If they have a mammogram, the false positive rate is over 60%. So over 6,000 women as compared to only five of 10,000. Five of 10,000 benefit, 6,000 are harmed in variable ways, such as biopsies, surgeries, radiation, chemotherapy, all sorts of things. And so this is not exactly what you'd call a precise screening test, right? Uh, so I put together this recent thing that uh, what you can get for $3 trillion, which happens to be our annual healthcare expenditures in the US these days, and so roughly, you can get 60% or greater false positive. And that is including um, PSA, which has an 80% false positive rate. And you can get one in four patients harmed in a hospital in the US. That hasn't changed. In fact, recent data suggests it has continued not to budge despite all these quality assurance programs. 12 million or more serious diagnostic errors 
that's been well documented. The fourth leading cause of death are medication errors and adverse events. And one other thing that we just reviewed is that 80% of the top prescription drugs lack a response by patients for clinical outcomes. That is imprecision medicine, okay? We can do better than this. I hope you would agree, right? We have to do better than this. So how do we do better than this? Well, fortunately, there's this new ability to digitize a human being, to understand a human being in a granular, high-definition way like we've never been capable of doing before. And so there's lots of articles about re, uh, features about digitizing human beings. Uh, these are a couple. Here's uh, Nature Biotech. Uh, here is the Washington Post recent feature last month about the human upgrade, the digital revolution. Here is a review that we recently published uh, from Scripps um, on all the different mobile sensors, the wearable sensors by which you can digitize the human physiome, uh, just one part of the human um, digitization process. Uh, just uh, last week in The Economist was the organ on a chip. This is the lung on a chip at Harvard. It's the ability, any organ on a chip, uh, to be able to digitize that organ's function, and uh, that should help in drug uh, development and particularly uh, be much more precise about how we uh, develop drugs suitable for any individual because any individual's uh, induced pluripotent stem cells can be put on a chip. There's also single cell sequencing. So we're not just talking about at the whole level of the human being. We're talking about at the single cell level of a human being. So this is now the ability to uh, digitize one cell at a time. That's overall. Here's digitizing the brain one cell at a time. And uh, we can get this to Eric and, and I were just talking about this to the single molecule with certain uh, uh, sequencing platforms such as PacBio or, or Oxford. One can do single molecule sequencing, talk about uh, high resolution uh, digital uh, definition. So this sets up, and that's I think in some respects why this uh, precision medicine initiative has come about, because we have new tools to be much more precise. I'm, I'm not so keen on the name precision medicine, but at least uh, you get the sense that we can digitize human beings, and that's a new, exciting opportunity. And uh, not to forget that we're talking not just about ACTGs and sequence, but also zero ones, because that obviously is all part. These six characters are going to be the way that we express that digitized human. And we're talking about multi layers, like a Google map of an individual. Uh, the GIS, the Geographic Information System, much akin to a street traffic satellite view uh, for a map. Now we have these different views. They include the phenome or the external features, the uh, sensors, the physiome, the anatome by imaging, for imaging, and then all these different biologic omics, DNA, RNA, proteins, metabolites, microbiome, the exposome, I also mentioned the epigenome, but the exposome is a way we can quantify through sensors our environment for the first time, really. Uh, so just last week in science, a single droplet of blood uh, get to get the entire virome of exposure of an individual. Not just every virus that person's ever been exposed to, but when they've been exposed to. A single droplet of blood that costs $25. Talk about Moore's Law at work and to be able to do this so inexpensively. Uh, it's pretty darn remarkable. In fact, that's another layer I didn't even anticipate that was kind of just thrown into the microbiome. This is about viral exposure. Now, it's not just about big data, which is, I know, the theme of the conference, that this series. It's about long data, that is, longitudinal data. That is, it's much more valuable if you have data on a human being many points along the way. And that essentially is what this 10 um, point uh, graph is trying to show is that we can define a human being digitally uh, from pre-womb to tomb in various ways. And this is quite exciting. Now I'm going to go through some of these ways and highlight uh, some of them as we go forward. So uh, sequencing has gone through a breakthrough phase that's greatly exceeded Moore's law in terms of output, in terms of expense. And it's pretty uh, remarkable to see what's happened in just 
uh, a decade. Now we are sequencing more than a terabyte a day, and that's obviously going to continue to increase. And the number of people who are going to be sequenced this year, if you look at this projection, over 400,000, and that's going to quickly double each in the next couple of years. And before you know it, we're going to have millions of people sequenced, which we have that many people sequenced in order for us to understand what the sequence of a human being is really all about. And there are several big international projects that are sequencing 100,000 or more individuals, complete or whole genome sequencing, now that the price for doing that is much less. However, not many have paid attention to the ability to have diploid genomes, unfortunately. Most of this is not a diploid genome sequencing, and that perhaps is going to be particularly important. I know that's work that, um, that Eric and others have done to try to foster the importance of the diploid genome. There's so many things we learn uh, when, we, when we have that as compared to the way sequencing has largely been until now. So now let's just start uh, zooming in on this pre-womb to tomb story. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, say that a lot's happened even since uh, I published this review in Cell uh, over a year ago. So for the pre-womb, what's amazing is that couples largely, almost rarely ever have screening of the common uh, mutations that are known to be associated with serious congenital abnormalities. And it's really too bad because we're talking about things that, like cystic fibrosis, ataxia, telangiectasia, uh, Tay-Sachs, so many things that could be prevented, but so few who have the test. And this is a very inexpensive test. And I was struck by this. This was a Wall Street Journal article early, earlier this year. It mentioned a lot of the companies that do this, uh, this pre-womb, uh, this pre preconception testing. And it said, a genetic test for women who are expecting. Well, sorry, it's also for men, right? What's, what is this women thing? So um, this is really, I, I was going to write in about this, but I never got around to it. But really, uh, obviously, this is a, uh, the, the parents. Uh, and both of them need to be screened. And that's, of course, the whole story about being able to prevent serious, the, the most extraordinary prevention possible. And we don't even use it. And one of the most uh, salient themes I'm going to try to leave with you today is that we know so much in genomics. And we don't use that information. Uh, I'm not going to take uh, this phone call. Didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't, uh, actually somebody from Google calling. Uh, didn't uh, Rudy uh, want to take a phone call in the middle of his, uh, his uh, press? I don't know. The uh, mayor, Rudy Giuliani, I, I just remembered that. OK. Um, now, so there's Tinder for Tay Sachs. You know, a lot of young people in the group might know Tinder, uh, maybe. but. Uh, now you have this idea that you should be, we should be, all be doing this. And uh, in fact, just last week, there was a nice article in Popular Science, no less, Popular Science, about a woman who'd had her preconception testing done, uh, which turned out to be uh, negative and reassuring. So that brings to this cartoon, do you actually take Nesbitt and his genome to be your husband? <laughs> so here we have all this information, a panel of genotypes ready to go, and nobody essentially using it. Really unfortunate. So that has to get uh, fixed. Now let's move on to the hottest molecular test in the history of medicine. These NIPTs, non-invasive uh, prenatal testing. So uh, digitizing the fetus at 8 to 12 weeks with a single tube of blood. OK, there's 4 million live births in the United States each year. How many? In the last year, how many pregnant women have had a tube of blood to sequence their fetus? I hope there'll be a response. I know the room's cold, but not that cold. A hundred. Any, any higher? A thousand. Hundred and fifty. Ten thousand. Five thousand. Okay. All right. Well, this is going to surprise you. There's been 800,000, one in five women in the United States have had this test. One in five, and it's going up quickly. This was just in Nature two weeks ago, and this is a, a nice commentary by Diana Bianchi at Tufts, who's one of the leaders of this whole movement. And uh, it's projected that by 
Two years from now, it'll be over 50%. Amniocentesis in this country has already dropped by 80%. 80%. Pretty striking. By digitizing a fetus. How did we do that before? Through crude measures like the uh, size of the fetal neck and alpha fetal protein, a very indirect uh, way to assess this. Now we have a direct measurement of chromosomal abnormality. But you know what's interesting is you don't just digitize the fetus. Sometimes you digitize the mother. And we had an uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, Stephen Quake, who's the pioneer in this field at Stanford and I uh, in January about the, the stethoscope, a real stethoscope that looks into the human uh, being, uh, not a phone, which is the old uh, stethoscope, and you find out so much stuff from alien DNA or RNA. So, for example, uh, you not only can do um, a viral, a bacterial uh, assessment, but you can do a fetal assessment, and you can do a cancer, tumor, circulating tumor DNA from a single tube of blood. So that's when you get unexpected results. And so of these hundreds of thousands of women who are healthy, having a, a test to see about Down syndrome or other chromosomal abnormalities of their expectant baby, what happens? Some of them turn out to have cancer from this sample. This is one example. This is a patient named Eunice Lee, who's actually a doctor, an anesthesiologist in Santa Barbara, who we presented at our Future of Genomic Medicine conference. Eric and several of you were at that conference in March. And so this is a woman who was 40, and she was having her second pregnancy. And at 10 weeks, she had the blood sample, and she got a call from her obstetrician that uh, th that there's something abnormal, that she might have cancer. She had a workup. She had a large colon cancer mass that was resected laparoscopically, and she gave birth to Benjamin uh, at term and has done beautifully. She's the first uh, woman of probably 100 at least who, who've come out to tell their story about, I got this pregnancy test, and I found out I had cancer. Just think of how powerful this could be in the future for picking up cancer before there are any symptoms whatsoever. Now, in today's Wall Street Journal, there's a very interesting article, and that's about miscarriages. It's a kind of a taboo subject that isn't discussed, and it made me think about how my wife and I uh, went through at least two miscarriages, and th there's so much known about it. It's a ge more than half are due to um, genetic abnormalities, but nothing is assessed, uh, and it's really unfortunate. And in fact, there are new techniques, such as uh, you're looking at RNA or the aborted uh, fetus, fetal uh, DNA to understand why there is a miscarriage, particularly in habitual miscarriages. So this is an open field, and it's a big deal. How many miscarriages are there in the United States each year? I already mentioned there's 4 million live births. How many miscarriages? A million. More than a million. At least a million. So, we're talking about a very substantial problem that is just waiting for science, waiting for patients to have the understanding of root cause fully defined. And we can do that. What's amazing to me is we can even, on a mobile app, watch uh, a, a conceptus, uh, a uh, in vitro fertilization, and watch the embryo development under high power microscope. The parents can watch this on a mobile app. I mean, is that amazing? So. Uh, we can do better. Uh, this is, of course, the very controversial area of trying to manipulate the uh, uh, embryo with uh, CRISPR, uh, the uh, genome editing tool, which is so powerful. And so this is, I think, a very uh, impressive time that we live in when it's theoretically possible that we could engineer uh, change genes, mutations at this very early stage, and there's been a call for banning this at the embryo level, but certainly it can be going on, and as it has, in many other diseases such as sickle cell uh, and, and others. But one thing that really is like a pet peeve of mine about this, now we're in this, this area about uh, uh, the fetal uh, digitizing young uh, unborn uh, baby, and that is that there's a lot of talk about designer babies, and this is particularly related to mitochondrial diseases, and it's really ridiculous, and especially ridiculous in the United States. So this is a UK 
uh, teenager, Alana Saarinen, who is perfectly healthy, who wouldn't be if she did not uh, result as a product of a three-parent baby. And this three-parent baby thing, that's the term that's used for mitochondrial disease, the way to prevent a mitochondrial disease from being transmitted. And this is actually kind of crazy when you think about it. The three parents, two of the parents uh, are donating 3.4 uh, billion base pairs. The third parent uh, is 16,000 base pairs. So they're not exactly proportionate here. Uh, and so, at any rate, in this country, mitochondrial diseases uh, with a three-parent baby is not accepted. But certainly it already is in the UK and many other places. And it just really lacks a sense of, of progress. All right, now we have this newborn. And so what are we going to do genomically for a sick newborn? Or maybe for all newborns someday? And so today, it's this crude thing that's been going on for 60 years, a heel stick, which is sent off this clot of blood on a piece of filter paper. And then weeks later, the results come back, typically, a couple of weeks later. And they could actually have very critical metabolic diseases like galactosemia and phenylketonuria, and there could be irrevocable brain damage while the results are pending. And in fact, this article, this article that won a Pulitzer Prize from the Milwaukee Sentinel Journal, uh, actually showed that the wait time in many hospitals throughout this country is exceeding two, three, four weeks, which obviously is unacceptable. So nature has projected that someday all children will be sequenced at birth. That seems far off. Right? Uh, but also uh, at uh, Kansas City, at the Children's Mercy Hospital, uh, they are doing systematic sequencing of newborns who are not uh, uh, immediately healthy upon birth. And that may be the wave of the future. And so this whole idea of sequencing uh, newborns, uh, neonates, is an exciting area that's just getting off the ground with several studies. But here, uh, one other pediatrician uh, projects uh, that uh, every readouts of every mutation uh, will be asked to predict a newborn's health for the rest of his or her life. So let's get into undiagnosed diseases, because this is one of the biggest areas that genomics has already started to make a dent in. It. And to give that, uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't use undiagnosed disease as a term in medicine. We have this other term called idiopathic. Now, why do we have to have this fancy medical term? Why don't we just say, we don't know? Why don't we just say that? No, we have to have fancy Latin words for the idios and the pathic. And upon uh, checking this on Twitter, I found another definition uh, for this. And uh, it means that the patient is pathological and the doctor is an idiot. <laughs> now, I wanted to tell you about the first of now 25 families that we've been asked to assess as part of both a research and clinical project at Scripps. And this is the Grossman family. Lily Grossman, who um, is a teenager, uh, has been neurologically um, impaired um, for unable to walk and has lots of other neurologic uh, serious problems, although cognitively intact. And her parents, uh, Gay and Steve, had been to lots of different medical centers and had told a, a, a bill of um, over 1.6 million, and some of these medical centers multiple visits, and no diagnosis for Lily. So uh, as we, we do is we sequence the trio, uh, if not more, of individuals in the family, but in this case, the trio. And of course, that's a lot of work uh, to understand the bioinformatics, as you especially understand here. And I won't get into that, but certainly to find the, the root cause mutation, which Ali Torquemani leads in our uh, institute, and uh, this is a piece of work, but he's been successful in about 60% of these cases, which is really uh, terrific and higher than what's in the literature, uh, and was able to identify a in this um, ADCY5 uh, gene. And this particular mutation, another uh, uh, individual had, and now, uh, by social media, we have learned that there's about 20 people so far identified with the exact same mutation and variable neurologic um, um, penetrance, uh, usually pretty similar to Lily's situation. So when we had this diagnosis, 
uh, and gave it back to Lily and her parents, she was incredibly gratified because that led to trying different medications that are directed to this root cause, and this was written up in National Geographic. And I'm also pleased to uh, mention that she's doing quite well. Uh, and in fact, just uh, over the weekend, she graduated from high school and she's off to college, and it's really uh, fantastic. And it's just one example of someone who went for years uh, with uh, 18 years uh, without a diagnosis. And we have already gotten up to 25 and recently published the first 17 uh, in genetics and medicine. Now, disease prevention is a big area too. And disease prevention uh, is interesting because then we can learn the, n the lessons from nature. The lessons from nature about people that don't get disease and uh, use that to simulate that with drugs or other means. So these knockouts, of course, are very intriguing and there's lots of them to be able to prevent uh, HIV or to be able to prevent heart disease. As many of these have been identified. And of course, the PCSK9 is a hot area right now because these drugs, two of them, monoclonal antibodies to, against this, to simulate the knockout, uh, were just uh, recommended for approval by the FDA last week. So they're certainly front and center of this uh, theme of preventing diseases through genomics. But there's many other, they aren't knockouts, but they are protective alleles, such as this for diabetes, this SLC308A8, and the other ones like this Neiman Pick uh, gene, where they're not uh, knockouts, but they have a remarkable effect of preventing common diseases. And here you see another example, APOC3, and uh, th these other examples go on to this APP variant that protects against Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline, even in people who are APOE4 homozygotes in their 90s. Pretty remarkable. So a, a, a potential path that's already inborn in human beings to prevent uh, serious but common uh, diseases. And uh, Steve Quake, in addition to the work that he's done on NIPT development, has shown uh, uh, over a year ago now that you could use RNA, circulating RNA, to assess virtually any organ in the body. So you could get a snapshot about the brain or the fetus or any organ just through circulating RNA, which is a really another exciting area for prevention. Now, infectious disease is, the way we do that today, make the diagnosis, is seemingly archaic. We draw these cultures, we wait days for the results to come back, then another day for the antibiotic sensitivities come back. Meanwhile, the patient gets all sorts of antibiotic coverage with sometimes toxic antibiotics. Can't we do better than that? And uh, we can. And so Sharon Peacock and many others have argued that we should have sequencing facilities in every real hospital today, which we don't have. Uh, but here's an example why we should have. And this is a young boy, uh, 14, uh, Joshua Osborne, who was about to die. He was in status epilepticus. He'd had a brain biopsy. It was, didn't, was unrevealing. And then finally, just sequencing his cerebral spinal fluid revealed the underlying pathogen. And he was treated appropriately and did beautifully. But he was rescued from near death. And that is not the normal protocol, obviously. This is the exception, the rare case where sequencing saved a life. And so we have all this capability, but it hasn't been embraced in medical practice. We have now these little handheld devices that can do targeted or pathogen sequencing, and they are proliferating. And here's an article just recently, uh, last month in Nature, about how they were used in West Africa to sequence recently uh, Ebola. This is the uh, Oxford Nanopore uh, platform. So we aren't using it, but we could, and it could make a big difference in infectious diseases. Next up is obviously the biggest area. It's quickly becoming the number one cause of death, overriding heart disease, and that's cancer. Cancer uh, is a genomic disease. Now, uh, interestingly, the former NCI director published in 2003 uh, that NCI set its goal of eliminating suffering and death due to cancer in 2015. I don't think it worked. I don't know what you're thinking, but I think that was a very bad projection. Uh, and then you have these, you know, making cancer history. I mean, help me. You know, it's not going to be history in our lifetime. Maybe never history, but that's the Moonshots program at 
MD Anderson. Well, if you look at the data, like this graphic shows, there hasn't been any reduction in death overall for cancer. There's more survivors uh, that, that eventually, with more recent therapy, that have relapses, often with these very genome-targeted drugs, but nine months later, the cancer comes back. But overall, the reductions in cancer mortality are very minor compared to what you see with heart disease. And so, how are we going to change this? Well, for one, we have a tremendous understanding about the ge genetics uh, uh, of cancer, the genomics, the biology. We understand the 200 genes that are either oncogene, oncogenes or tumor suppressive genes. We have at least identified most of them. That's a big breakthrough. And that's through the systematic sequencing of tumor uh, DNA and paired with germ germline DNA to assess what are the causative uh, mutations or the abundant mutations. And then Nazneen Rahman from the UK has put together a wonderful review article on cancer predisposition genes, and we know most of those. And that's exciting because then we would know who's at high risk for cancer, and then we'd be able to screen people uh, with the appropriate type of imaging and other uh, modalities, could be a molecular stethoscope in the future, to be able to tell if they are having the earliest signs of cancer. And indeed, we're at a fortunate time because these recent announcements to do a series of gene uh, sequence, uh, for example, 20 genes for predisposition of cancer, including BRCA1 and 2, by color genomics, and then just last week, Veritas gen uh, Genetics for $199 to do uh, breast cancer, BRCA genes. So we're getting to the point where it'd be very inexpensive and very attractive to understand predisposition uh, genes for people to know they are at a much higher risk. But we can barcode the cancer now. That isn't being used, but it can be done, and it certainly, uh, in many respects, should be done. We can construct a Google map of the cancer that is sequencing the tumor paired with the germline, and then also in the tumor, the RNA-seq and can get a map of proteins and metabolites and, uh, you know, obviously put that all together uh, with the microRNA and the clinical data, and you know so much more about that individual's tumor, and there are no two individuals with the same exact cancer. And so we're in the earliest stages, you could qualify them as quite rudimentary, of sequencing cancer. Like, for example, foundation medicine, which you can sequence a few hundred genes, the exons, uh, by sending away a paraffin block. Uh, or uh, Johns Hopkins uh, spin out personal genome diagnostics that are trying to get up to a whole exome. But these are still in the early stages. And what sequencing has done is help to bring these drug companies uh, to realize that if they want to develop good cancer drugs, they need to get involved in sequencing and work together and bring this data together. And so what's really, I think, quite uh, impressive, it's just in last year, this is from the uh, ASCO report, all these drugs, the monoclonal antibodies, were approved by the FDA that are genomically uh, guided, except for immunotherapy, genomically guided drugs, which brings me to immunotherapy, the hottest, most exciting therapy for cancer. Uh, but we don't, it's very expensive, and there are many more of these immunotherapy checkpoint PD-1 drugs that are coming but we don't know how to, who should get them. A very small number of people respond. We don't even know which tumors are the best so far to administer these drugs. But if we did uh, careful studies, we might be able to find out. We're starting to see that there's a genetic basis for immunotherapy in melanoma, as this recent New England Journal paper. But moreover, why don't we do immunosequencing? and the immune rep repertoire, and then to start to understand who should get immunotherapy and who shouldn't. Uh, because obviously there's a risk to this therapy beyond its major expense. So hopefully that'll happen in the future. But then just last week, um, this article about pharmacites was uh, published, and pharmacites are the idea of loading up T cell with nanoparticles directed against the individual's tumor. It's pretty exciting, and uh, I think that is another Way, another uh, way that that was um, uh, being approached is actually with Google and Andy Conrad, who was here when I was last here for a symposium at Mount Sinai, 
uh, Innovation uh, uh, Symposium, and they are doing something pretty similar with nanoparticles versus cancer that are genomically uh, guided. But the interactions are complex, and whole idea of this uh, is, is, is really um, formidable because we now know that, for example, some drugs for cancer don't work if there are certain bacteria in, the, in that individual's microbiome. So this is not a simple task by any means. Now, one other really area of excitement in cancer that's genomically based is I mentioned there's circulating tumor DNA. The more of that that's present, the worse prognosis. And the fact that this can be sequenced uh, is really pretty uh, re remarkable. And this is some work from Johns Hopkins, which has initiated in many ways this field. And now there are these companies that you can send a, a tube of blood for sequencing the circulating tumor DNA, such as GARDEN. And that is minimal. They're only sequencing 30 genes for which there's actionable information. But just think where that can go in the future. So cancer is in a dynamic state right now. Many uh, things that would suggest that we're going to make some, some real substantive progress. Now, uh, just to roll out these other areas before we get to the end of a lifespan, molecular diagnosis, uh, this is, and, and pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics is ready. But again, just like preconception uh, genetics, we don't use the data. So there's all these studies that show commonly used drugs, particular alleles that are associated with serious side effects or with lack of efficacy, and we don't use this in clinical practice. It's really unfortunate. We have all this information, so much work and resources were used to get this information, and then we don't use it in patients. And that has to change. And so these are recent discoveries for vincristine, a commonly used drug for cancer, inducing neuropathy. Do we check this in anyone who gets vincristine to avoid this serious neuropathy? No. Here's for children that are getting cisplatinum, another in pediatric cancer, not an uncommon drug, but it can cause severe hearing loss. Do we check that in children who are going to get this drug? No. So we have all this information. It's coming out fast and furious. The, the pharmacogenomics is a hot area, and we don't use it clinically. And we don't actually go after it either. And there's also the unknowns about things like copy uh, numbers, which are pervasive throughout all these points along one's health span. The last thing I wanted to get into uh, along this timeline uh, is molecular autopsy. And this is a very, uh, uh, we think, a big area that's been under uh, recognize how important it is. I thought this picture was great because it's now in the Mount Sinai Health System. It's from 1896, uh, this autopsy room. We are not learning from the deceased, especially the deceased who have sudden death when they're young. And most of these people, when they have an autopsy, if they have an autopsy, is unrevealing. So why aren't we sequencing these individuals? Well, we are, at least, and we've started this program. We started it last fall, and we have now over 10 families where we sequence the deceased and the other family members who are, up till now, been left in the lurch as to whether they're at risk for sudden death. Imagine living your life thinking that in the back of your mind every day. This was an article I just came across last week in the UVA alumni magazine. I'm a, a UVA alumnus. I said, oh my gosh, they published this article, sleuthing sudden death. And I'm trying to figure out where did they get this picture from? This picture, why would you have a step? <laughs> Moreover, why would you have that headgear, you know, from the ancient stuff? What is this? Anyway, we could sleuth sudden death. And we now have engaged the not just San Diego County, which is a big county of three and a half million people, LA County, San Francisco. We'd love to get every county in the country and then someday even other countries. That's the only way we're going to get these variants of unknown significance sorted out by having lots of families uh, who have sudden, unexpected sudden death. That gets us to having all this data. And here's an article that was published by the IEEE, the engineering uh, journal. Big data is transforming medicine. No, it isn't. It could, but it isn't yet. The reason is several. One is that we have all this data, and we hoard it. We just hoard all the data and store it. We don't analyze it, except for at the Icon Institute, of course. But everywhere else, it's not analyzed. 
we just have lots of it and we're getting you know, torrential more of it, but we don't process it properly. So that's a problem. And this medicine by numbers, it can't go forward unless we have meaningful extraction um, analytics that are associated with all this mass of data. Then the other thing we don't have is an openness. And this is a real serious problem. So beyond the liquid biopsy excitement that MIT Tech Review acknowledged, this idea of the internet of DNA. And what does that mean? Well, uh, Lori Becklin, the LA Times journalist who died earlier this year, and the Times published posthumously her op-ed. And she wrote, she died of breast cancer. And she wrote, uh, I think this is quite telling, that uh, we, uh, we are each, in effect, one person clinical trials, yes. Yet the knowledge generated from those trials will die with us because there is no comprehensive database. This is a journalist. And she says further, in the big data era, this void is criminal. And she's right. Why aren't we learning from every individual? Why don't we have this open data plan? Why don't we have the resources set up to do this? We have sequencing going on at several facilities, and none of that data clinically being used. So we, the future is open, which happened to be uh, the cover of this Thompson Reuters report. And the whole idea is that we now, uh, not just these projects happen, uh, the Personal Genome Project, George Church, I'm sure spoke quite a bit about that when he was here, but you know, the, the whole idea of the uh, microbiome and the virome and open humans and all this, it's pretty exciting stuff. But we have it for clinical purposes. So how come we can have an app that's called True that's gonna have every human's phone number in it, a mobile app on the planet? Already has 1.6 billion and it's rising quickly. It's probably well over 2 billion now. And how can we have Facebook with 1.4 billion people in Facebook as a social uh, community. Why can't we have a medical community like Facebook or like True? Why can't we do this? And why shouldn't we do this? So that's what I wrote about in The Patient Will See You Now, that we have to do this. It's incumbent on us to learn from each individual to help the next individual or even the same person later on in their life by having all this data and analyzed probably by the Icon Institute. So this is that. Uh, uh, commentary I put uh, that Orly McCall had asked to write about this big miss. We're missing out on this opportunity. It's extraordinary. We need to get on it. We need to figure out how we can do this, whether it's for cancer or molecular autopsy or for all things medical. But this is an opportunity just waiting before us in the big data era. It's exciting, but it's also depressing that we're doing nothing about it. Now, I want to get into the Brave New World devices stuff because that's, we think too much about just omics and just DNA sequencing. And to define a human being, we have to have all those layers defined. And no human being has had all those layers defined. Michael Snyder at Stanford is the one who comes closest, but still not all the layers. So this consumer reports about Brave New World, the smart devices got into the medical devices. We can democratize medicine because of these devices, because these are consumer apps and ads to a smartphone. Like being able to do a cardiogram, a patient sending me emails that I have atrial fibrillation, as many of them do now, because this is consumer FDA approved. Being able to do glucose right on the phone for diabetics, every five minutes getting updated, wearing a tiny sensor on the arm or the abdomen. Being able to look on your watch to see your glucose any moment in time with trends and getting a, a, uh, a notification if there is a uh, low or high, as you preset, uh, glucose level. And that's great for an individual, but how about for a family with two type 1 diabetic children? And isn't it amazing now that the mother can just look at her watch and see, track both kids' glucoses simultaneously, all the time? And of course, these are kids that are frequently have problems with both hypo and hyperglycemia. That's in a big advance when you just look down and see glucose. And you can get medication reminders to promote medication adherence, which I think you know is a very big issue, because 50% of people, irrespective of socioeconomic background, don't take their medicines as prescribed. 
and obviously for those uh, don't derive potential benefit. Then the ability to have blood pressure on a watch, every heartbeat is now starting to come to pass. So here's an example of blood pressure, 24 hour plot for mine, uh, and it's actually pretty amazing. You can look at your watch at any moment and see your blood pressure and it's tracking it while you're sleeping, while you're in traffic, while you're having stress, and you wouldn't normally have those blood pressures during those moments. Now, we had gotten way past the Dick Tracy era, uh, of course, the idea of having this on your watch. Uh, this was the original conception of the smartwatch. Can you imagine typing on that smartwatch? This was 1981, 1981. So, some people say, I don't want this watch, I want to have a tablet, I want something big, I don't want to have to write, do something on the watch. So, uh, this is a Time Magazine conception of what that might look like when the whole hype about the Apple Watch came about. And this is actually now a reality. Uh, this is a bracelet projector, and look what happens when you um, have, uh, you're, in the, you're in the path uh, and you are want to, you want to, oops, go back here. You want to, here we go. You want to become a cyborg. Pretty impressive, if you don't have to work on a little watch, right? So, okay. It's a thing you can hold to your head, forehead, and get your all sorts of uh, parameters, including blood pressure, oxygen concentration, cuffless blood pressure, the necklace to get cardiac output and stroke volume, a uh, little uh, uh, Band-Aid that costs less than a dollar a make. Talk about cheap chips and Moore's Law. That gets all these parameters uh, that are listed here, and we're using, actually, uh, it started using in Western Africa with a new project that Steve Steinhobel and our group is heading up. Uh, we can quantify mood. And for depression, which is the number one cause of disability, this is a big deal, through voice, tone, inflection, and through uh, EEG and all sorts of vital signs, galvanic skin response. So we can quantify mood now for the first time by bringing all this data together. And these sensors that we have today are primitive going quickly into new directions like embeddable, uh, non-contact, already uh, embedded into pills like Proteus. They can be degradable and they also can be injectable. Just last week there was a major publication about injecting um, sensors, nanosensors, into brain tissue, which can then be formed as a way to attract uh, the brain. Now, just to point out how this democratization is going forward because of smartphones, the ability for each human being to digitize themselves is the idea that LabCorp has uh, already approved uh, consumers to order their own lab tests. That was a foreign idea. Now it's one of the two largest laboratories, central laboratories in the United States. And the fact is you can do any routine lab that's liver function, kidney function, uh, thyroid function, uh, electrolytes, CBC through a smartphone now, but not commercially yet available. Or you can be in Rwanda and you could diagnose with 100% accuracy uh, HIV or syphilis uh, through a smartphone that costs a few dollars and have it results back in, within uh, 30 minutes. You can do self-exam or examine a child, for example, with a simple attachment like an otoscope and of course be able to know that a child has an ear infection through uh, algorithms, cloud computing, and the whole idea that you can diagnose a skin lesion or rash more accurately through a smartphone app and cloud interpretation than going to a doctor. That seems pretty uh, re remarkable. So the exam, you can of course go well beyond the exam. You can do the other parts of the exam like the oral cavity and throat or the eye, full eye exam with what now is being called the EYE iPhone. And this includes even a slit lamp exam. So it's pretty remarkable. Now, the problem we have today, it's hard to go to see the doctor. And it varies from city to city and specialist to specialist. But for primary care doctors, what is the average time it takes to get an appointment in the United States? By the way, it's over six weeks in Boston. But overall in the United States, what is the average time to see, get an appointment? Eight weeks? Not that bad. I thought 2.6 weeks is pretty bad though, right? And 
Uh, now you don't have to wait to the doctor because everybody will see you except the doctor. You have the crowd will see you now, the computer will see you now, the economist. You have the smartphone will see you now. Of course, my favorite, the patient will see you now. Uh, we have the Google will see you now, Dr. Google, excuse me. Uh, Watson will see you now. We have the robot will see you now. We have the avatar will see you now. Everybody will see you now except the doctor. That takes 2.6 weeks, right? So I thought you'd appreciate this because the world is changing quickly. Let me just put this up here. Oh, you don't have the audio. Oh, gosh. Uh, you're not going to hear it. I am getting a lot of work done. Your Wi-Fi is very fast. But he's ready for you now. I'll be with him as soon as I can. But you're next. <laughs> what does this acronym stand for? Help me. Come on, I know you know this. I want what I want when I want it. That is what mobile devices have created. A and it's setting up for on-demand medicine. And now you can get anything delivered to your house from your to the handyman, to medical marijuana. And you get a doctor coming to your house, Uber. So these are five apps that bring the doctor right to your house. And uh, one of them is called Heal. It's actually backed by Lionel Richie. So I wrote to him and said, I thought you should call it all night long. And he said, <laughs> he said no, it's also all day long. Uh, OK. So for $99 or even $49, you have a doctor come to your house. And uh, now we have this new look, which is uh, you can't list your iPhone as your primary care physician. <laughs> Not yet. And so you are into this uh, space as well, democratizing research with smartphones, just blowing out the old way of doing medical research. And uh, that's clinical trials and obviously research kit and, uh, Mount Sinai and um, the ICON were very instrumental in one of the five apps, uh, the asthma app. And this is terrific. This is really changing the face of how we can go forward and do efficient and rapid and inexpensive medical research. I won't get into that further, but connecting apps with the health systems is a challenge. And this is an article I'll refer you, for those who are interested, just published last week from uh, Zach Cohane and the group from uh, Boston Children's. Now, uh, it, the companies are starting to get into this, especially for diabetes and clinical trials. So leading pharma all have figured out this is big. So they're finally getting into this as well. Now, just a few caveats before closing, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation discussion with you. Uh, one is that we, it's great that we live in this hyper-connected world. Isn't that wonderful? No, not always, obviously, because there's a problem with privacy and security. And we have some who are proclaiming that we are at the end of privacy. That won't work in medicine. People don't want their medical diagnoses and treatments and data all out on the internet, unless you're in a personal genome project or something, which is a rare bird. So uh, this kind of, we have a problem with this area. And this cartoon captures it well. Dad says, you're monitoring all our phone calls. Obama says, he's not your dad. <laughs> is the state today. <laughs> it brings it all together, privacy, security, genomics, mobile devices, all in one simple cartoon. We have to do better than this. By access to our DNA, I've written about this. We don't have the right way. We have the AMA, the FDA, all sorts of entities that are fighting democratization of DNA. And then we have companies like 23andMe and color genomics and Vista and all these that are trying to, Veritas that is, to try to uh, help consumers get access to their data. But what's really interesting is this was just presented, but it published previously at the European meetings last week, which is that people, consumers, want genomic data more than the researchers want their data. 
and more that they're willing to give their data. And that is uh, also the case from your own report that I just saw last week from the European Journal of Human Genetics, where uh, as the conclusion, regardless of these concerns, the majority of participants indicate they want to receive all or most of their personal results arising from whole genome sequencing. But we are so paternalistic, we don't think people can handle it. And we treat patients as if they're the rod danger fields, which we have to do better than that. So last point is about who owns the data and where is this going to go. And this is a problem, because today, uh, in every state except New Hampshire, the data are owned by doctors and hospitals. Why is that? It's your data. You paid for it, and you don't have it. And you're, you're just groping for access to your data. You have to pay to have your results faxed to you. What's a fax machine, right? This is crazy. You should own your data. Everyone should own your data. Even the first health IT czar had an op-ed not long ago about this is a unqualified ownership is an individual right. Well, at the leading banking place in the world, Switzerland, they actually have a health bank where every Swiss citizen owns their data. That's why can't we have something like that in the United States? We have nothing. We don't even have protection of security and privacy, no less appropriate ownership. And we need to have an electronic locker that is a, a guard dog protected for our data that we own, and we don't have that. And that's crazy. It has to go get fixed. So eventually, if we get attentive to these things, we can have doctorless patients. Not true autonomous, but partial. That is, patients who can do a lot of their diagnostics and a lot of their uh, monitoring and then go to a doctor with that data for oversight, treatment, guidance, experience, wisdom, all the things that doctors are really good at and help patients. We'll always have humans treating humans just like uh, planes, uh, pilots. Uh, you need that, and that's why this is a great article just published from uh, Faster Cures, Margaret Anderson. Uh, passengers were the way we, patients were treated. Now they need to be co-pilots. It's a great article. If you haven't read it, it just came out. So uh, how do we get this new medicine? And this is, I think, a, a little bit of pieces that I've been trying to bring out during this. Uh, look forward to your reaction. Uh, old medicine is population-based. We hopefully highlighted how important individualized medicine is going to be in the future. Medicine has been a one-off doctor's office story. It needs to be real-time data streaming in a real world, that person's real world. You don't need doctor-ordered data. For the most part, we want patient-generated data. We don't want these doctor's notes that are unshared by almost 70% of American doctors. We want patients, our notes, with editing the notes that have a riddle with mistakes. Uh, we want the information owned by the rightful owner, the patient, the consumer. And we want to get away from these expensive big ticket items uh, and use Moore's Law and cheap chips. We can do that now, and I showed you some examples that are consumer price level. And finally, this whole theme of this uh, series about big data, long data, the fact is that we're datafying medicine. So hopefully someday we won't have all these terms like genomic medicine, personalized, individualized, and we'll just get rid of these, and then we'll know we have arrived at this new medicine. So let me just acknowledge all my colleagues at uh, STSI who really helped to shape this, and uh, thank you for your attention. I look very much forward to all your questions. Thank you. I think we'll... Uh, Sorry, I went so long, but I didn't know. <laughs> do the discussion format. Uh, so uh, wonderful, Eric. Lots of, uh, lots of things there. I'm sure uh, uh, we're, uh, Eric's interested in hearing some feedback yeah. and questions on. So we'll start. Uh, yes, uh, so I found the talk extremely interesting and, and illuminating. I'm over here. Yeah, the this lights side. are glaring. Now, I need sunglasses. <laughs> um, OK. So, uh, but I had trouble putting together two parts of your talk. In the beginning, you were talking about that it's a bad thing that some of the tests that are done have an extremely high false positive rate, and people worry about things, get tests, get, get um, uh, you know, per perhaps damaging results from, from those tests. But, but then you're arguing at the end that people should have access to their complete um, 
genome sequence, if they yeah. get that sequencing done, yeah. at a time where we can't really tell them which things are important and they can't figure it out on, on their own also. So, so I'm just wondering, you must have thought about this in, in oh, more yeah. depth, yeah. Uh, oh. th that there must be some way to, to, to navigate from sure. where we are now oh, to where we will I'm, be in the future. I'm so glad you asked that question. It's a very, um, very rational point. So what I'm saying is today where we do mass screening and give out drugs in a willy-nilly way without regard to that individual's makeup, that's the wrong way. And I'm also trying to point out, to get to the right way, we need to get these millions of people sequenced. We need to have this open data. We need to have people accessing their data because a lot of it might be missed by the doctors. So we're not there yet. We're in a transition point. But it, it, while we're warming up to that point, a few years from now, when we'll have millions of people sequenced and hopefully have uh, a resource which is really open medicine, while we're there, we have some work to do, like privacy, security, uh, and um, access and ownership, which is, is a mess right now. So I, I'm talking about the future, not always the present. But I'm against mass screening because I think that's an unintelligent uh, uh, way to go forward. Yeah, so we'll go. Unfortunately, we can't see your faces, so you'll just have to trust that we're looking in your direction. <laughs> But I know it's a Swedish guy because I can already hear. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, we'll just uh, maybe go ahead, Johan, and I can help okay. translate. It's good. Yeah. So maybe before you launch into that, just because people are online and I guess the microphone didn't work, so Johan uh, started by saying he was the greatest scientist in Sweden who was thinking about <laughs> <laughs> genetics. Uh, no, but that he started a 23andMe-like company and uh, so went through a lot of the issues uh, that I think we're going to go through here in thinking through this and a lot of it is uh, access. Uh, you know, different socioeconomic status, uh, defining whether you have access or not, or who can pay, who can't pay, and are those who are going to be able to pay benefiting more, and so on. So it's a good, a good topic. No, it's, you cut through a lot of areas there. Let me take the last one first. Um, smartphones are really darn powerful computing, and if you compare the cost of a smartphone, particularly one from Xiaomi, from China, that rivals, for $35, rivals the capabilities of Apple or Samsung's phones, $35. And you could have a multi-year data plan for a fraction of what it costs to be in the hospital for one day or in the emergency room for one visit. So I'm all in favor of studies to show that giving the indigent 
smartphones with data plans is a far better way to go for monitoring their chronic conditions than the way we do it today, where these are often the hotspotters that come back frequently, and not just one night uh, in those facilities, but many. Now, the question about the European view of consumer genomics, it's even more bleak than the American view, which is already bad enough, and that is paternalism this deep-seated paternalism in the medical community. And we don't believe that people can handle having their data. And we happened to publish in the New England Journal a study where we looked at thousands of people getting their, what was like a 23andMe Navigenics, I'm sure you're familiar with, and people handled it fine, even when they found out that they're APOE4 homozygotes. And other studies have corroborated that. So that is not, and if you do every consumer survey, as I showed the Mount Sinai, your own study, as well as the European uh, study, they want their data. They feel it's their data and entitled to it. So it's really unfortunate that, that was blocked. But that is uh, a deep entrenchment of the medical community that goes back before Hippocrates uh, even. Now, uh, the other question was, there were three, at least. <laughs> at least. I don't know. I can't recall. Yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> I don't Sorry, know. Sorry, Johan, we'll cover that after. So uh, the, you know, but just along those lines and maybe, you know, would uh, value your advice on, so as a group, many of us here fighting this good fight within a uh, medical center and looking to make partners of, of those we interact with in the clinic and obviously their hearts all in the right places of wanting to help people, what's your sort of advice on how do we you know, break down those uh, kinds of, like, have you seen that effectively done anywhere where you can be disruptive within the medical arena uh, without being ostracized uh, to sort of help push along uh, the uh, sort of reducing the paternalism and engaging more in this world that's coming? And if, if or do you see that that disruption is going to have to happen from the outside and it's just going to, uh, get so far advanced that the medical centers will be forced to do it because they won't survive if they don't. Like, what's the... Yeah, I the think, unfortunately, it's the latter. I don't think that we can auto-correct in our... because it's so deeply entrenched. I think what you're saying, Eric, is that it's going to require external forces to bear to really um, uh, precipitate a substantive change. Yeah. All right, we'll go to this uh, side on the right. Oh, that was very thought-provoking. And the one thing that struck me was... Is that was, Pallavi? It is yeah, Pallavi. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Hello there. Hi. <laughs> I know your voice. <laughs> so the one thing... The, <laughs> the one thing that struck me was the thought that many people often assume is that knowledge is power and ignorance is bliss, and somewhere in there is a continuum. And so if you... What would you say at what point is digitizing man absolutely corrupting humanness. Well, wow, that's very deep. Uh, <laughs> no, no, not surprising from you, Pallavi. <laughs> but right now, uh, what I alluded to, you know, we're not ready for healthy people. I know you just um, did a, your, your health seek was looking at this. We're not ready for health people to get whole genome sequencing, but we are ready for diabetics to have their glucose on their phone and for people with heart rhythm to have their heart rhythm digitized on their phone. And so a lot of these things are ready and they're, you know, we can do it today. And I think gradually we'll see this wave front expand. But, you know, there are others who, like Ray Kurzweil, believes in, you know, the singularity and all this. So I, I don't get, I'm not into that. I, I don't believe we're gonna be immortalized either. So there's all sorts of things in the spectrum here. but. There is a concern, a natural one, that uh, the more we become cyborgs and the more we rely on artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning of each individual, no less at a population level, that we will become, uh, you know, le this transcendent uh, human will be less human. And there's a legitimate concern there. And there's even fear. I don't know if you've seen the movie Ex Machina. It's a great movie. But, uh, you know, there's a fear of what we're doing. And then some like Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk have really emphasized these fears of what technology could do. So I don't see that. I see of a, this is man plus machines and not use wholly, but it's for specific reason. Yeah, and maybe even the speed with which you know, that it's going slower than we want is, uh, you know, maybe even a good thing to enable, give us a shot at being maybe more purposeful in, in the kind of world we want to live in, because I think if we're not more pur purposeful, you know, we may get a world uh, that none of us want. So how we engage the artificial intelligence, the robots, the integration of machines and human 
uh, like is something I think we better start thinking more deeply about as a, as a society to. Yeah, it's good to know that two speed demons. Oh, no, no, he. <laughs> Caution I, against I'm, it. I'm a, a complete wimp. He's a speed demon. <laughs> okay. Uh, I see blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's rather. Rod. Uh, thank you for a comprehensive overview and a lot of snippets of what the future holds for us. I was um, interested in your thoughts about um, drug development and uh, drug approval uh, from, from two standpoints. First one, um, from the drug development point, how do you see that these um, panomic approaches and access to electronic medical records can shorten our failures in phase two and phase three, which are about 50% or two thirds due to lack of efficacy, so we need to do a better job of target validation. But on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, agencies that are controlling the time that it takes to obtain the approval, do you see any way that that can be shortened? And the second part of the question, as, as a physician, when you have a patient, um, you mentioned cancer, let's take it for example, that you identify that a, a given cocktail of drugs for that individual could be beneficial if prescribed as an off-label or some sort of a treatment. How do we get on board the government agencies that are controlling, to some extent, our ability to uh, bring forth the knowledge that, that, that we come up with? Okay, a lot, of, a lot of stuff there. Very good points, all of them. Uh, so first, with respect to drug development, we don't take enough, I alluded to this, we don't take advantage of Mother Nature enough. And, um, you know, we, we, we now are starting to see this revolution in cancer drugs because we're learning that there's driver mutations that, can be, that are druggable. Unfortunately, they're the oncogenes, not the tumor suppressor genes, but it's a start. And for example, PCSK9 is, is beginning, if we sequence all these people that have these protective alleles and start to mimic protective alleles, we could really start to see an acceleration of, of um, important drugs rather than the way we've been doing it with molecular screening libraries and, and structural based discovery. I think there's a better way forward and we're starting to see the beginning of that. Uh, with respect to my biggest concern um, about the drugs today are the costs. The cost of these monoclonal antibodies and specialty drugs you know, the minimum is 100,000. The projected cost of the PCSK9 inhibitors once they're approved, and it goes to your point about using them off-label, is 150 billion a year. And quickly, we're gonna go from 400 billion a year pharma cost to over a trillion, just for pharma. And I wanna ask this group, if you paid $100,000 for a drug and it didn't work, don't you think you should get a refund? <laughs> and I wanna see a guaranteed to succeed model of drug development. And if you, if the drug works, you charge whatever you want, and I hope it isn't 100,000, but whatever, but if it doesn't work, there's no payment. And that's where I think drug, if drug companies got into that mindset, we could see some really big progress and not take us to this horrendous state of the trillion plus a year for drugs. And then the last point about off-label, off-label drugs um, today, all doctors have that discretion, and that can be good and bad. I mean, in a mutation-directed therapy, obviously a lot of cancers, when they do get sequenced, they have mutations that you wouldn't suspect, and you give drugs that are mutation-directed rather than the way they got approved uh, for melanoma or for a particular lung cancer or whatever. So that's a good thing, but of course, we have promiscuous prescribing as well. So there's two sides of that story. To your point of cost, just a small comment I read recently, uh, the term called pay for performance, yeah. that a given drug, if it uh, works really well in a sub subset of populations, I'm not going to name any names, that it can be charged, uh, let's say, $10,000 a treatment, and that the same drug in a um, already approved application in which it is on par with the current, let's say, chemotherapy, would only cost about $400. So that gives us some idea of why yeah. that remarkable. Yeah, I mean, cost. like you have Salvati, where there's been no shortage of critique about that, 80-some thousand dollars, a thousand dollar pill, but it has a 97% cure rate or 99% cure rate. But we have a lot of drugs that cost more than that that have 10% cure rate. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we have to come together at a better model for this. 
Hi, how's it going? My name is George Vaughan. I'm actually a, a graduate student at Scripps who's finishing up his research up here, so it's nice to see you visiting. Um, and I have, a, I have an anecdote followed by uh, a question where, so I am actually a product of um, sex selection because my parents had two girls and then wanted a boy. And so 27 years ago, we've had the technology to separate male between female producing sperm, which is essentially like the first step we've taken towards the creation of quote unquote designer babies. And I found it really interesting that we've had this mechanical separation based on certain characteristics of the sperm, but yet once we breach that into genetic separation or even now manipulation, it seems to be met with social, ethical, and religious barriers. And I just would like to uh, hear your thoughts on how those barriers are being broken down um, in this era, and if you think that it's going to take much longer before we're even able to do any slight manipulations to get rid of some of these uh, pure genetic diseases. Yeah, well, well that's an awfully important area. Uh, I'm very frustrated that this country is not with it for the best prevention of mitochondrial diseases. It's already been shown to be safe and is already approved in the UK, which tends to be much more conservative than the US. Uh, but there's obviously very serious concerns about uh, genome editing. Um, uh, so this, this is, you know, goes both ways. And uh, Eric Lander had a great New England Journal um, commentary uh, a couple weeks ago about this topic. Um, and obviously, we're not talking any longer about uh, gender selection. We're talking about what diseases can actually be eradicated uh, and where do we start. And this is something that's really opening up. And uh, it's hard to know, but we, we need some of the world's best bioethicists to come together and help meeting with scientists and physicians to, to draw where are the accepted boundaries today and then continue to revisit this uh, in the years ahead. Yeah, I mean, it seems like as that technology is perfected for eradicating disease, it will also be perfected for modifying traits uh, that, that some deem favorable. And so I think it is something we're going to have to learn as a society, like, you know, just educating and noodling on it and having open discussions, like, what is the world we want to live in? Like, do we want to see that sort of thing happen? Because I think it's going to be really hard to stop. Like, it's so cheap, easy to do, it's efficient. Like. You know, so it's like going to be an interesting yeah. play over the next 10 to 20 years. And we don't really have, you know, what we think is right is not necessarily right. the norm in the world. In China, they've sequenced um, a thousand or a few thousand people with you know, greater than 150 IQ to then what they're going to do with that data in the future. So, you know, there's all kinds of things out there that are right. concerning. Thank you. Hey, I'm Joe Barilla from uh, the Prototyping Center here at Mount Sinai and also an incoming PhD student. Uh, my question relates to the drug discovery pathway again, but at a slightly uh, deeper level even. Do you see a point in personalized medicine where the current uh, clinical trial format just doesn't work? There's just too much discrepancy between the drug I'm going to get for this type of cancer and the drug you'd get for the same type of cancer or something like that? Yeah, I, you know, I think this is... Uh Every, every cancer I would like to see get uh, a workup of uh, paired sequencing, RNA-seq at the, at, as a, a de minimis, no less more. But I'd like to see that now and how that leads to that individualized treatment and then using the liquid biopsy to track the cancer, whether there's new mutations that need attention. And also we have, at least still don't know, of course, immunotherapy, except that it seemed to work in types of cancers or individuals with cancer with a very dense mutation burden. So this, I think, is waiting to get this individualized approach. And uh, just like there are no two human beings that are identical, the same applies to cancer. So we have the kind of the early ideas of where this could go. It needs to be very economical. It needs to be quick. We don't really have the full drug armamentarium to do. Uh, and the immunotherapy, which is perhaps the most exciting for durable uh, results uh, obviously is in its infancy because it's just being applied blindly, uh, and I think that can be made you know so much more intelligent. All right, so I think uh, two more questions, and I know Andrew, I can 
tell because there's a six foot four or five frame That's standing right. up yeah. there, so my odds are probably pretty good. Very good. Um, so <laughs> I just wanted to take the questions back a little bit to one of your earlier points on the value of long data. And um, every single substantial software system I've ever deployed that involved any data component, there's always this massive question about what to do with the historical data. Uh, you know, do you migrate it, do you not migrate it? And enormous amounts of effort are spent on the question of the value of that data. Um, with regard to our medical data, of course, we have a choice. We could simply start, you know, putting on little $1 Band-Aid style sensors and generate data going forward. Uh, or we could spend a lot of effort trying to, you know, dig data out of medical records, which may be paper. You know, I can ask my mom, you know, what exactly the reports were like when I was 15 from high school. And, I mean, in the explorations you've done of long data, how do you see the trade-off on, you know, the value of really long data versus just starting to get rich data, you know, from now going forward? Have you uh, sort of yeah. got some thoughts on that? I, I'm glad you asked the question. I, I don't know the answer of what is the appropriate use. I just know that when you have baseline and you're going forward, it ought to be particularly anchoring and helpful. But, you know, for example, if for hypertension, where soon you'll be able to get your blood pressure every heartbeat, how, how long are you you know, to monitor that? Uh, you know, and what is the you know, the right way to deal with this kind of massive, you're generating a terabyte of data within a month or so. So we don't know, I don't think anyone has yet the uh, experience, the wisdom, but hopefully that you'll, you can lead us to that uh, in the times ahead. I'm yeah, counting you know, on you. Know, for, <laughs> for the heart rate question, I mean, you know, you might sort of say that the right, the, the right algorithm might turn out to be that basically you save, you know, the first 10 seconds of every month uh, and that's all you really need. Yeah, um, possible. You know, in that case, and if that's the case, you know, if I happen to have a, a good heart rate record from back when I was 25, that might be a valuable piece of information, which is outside value relative to more, you know, real-time monitoring in the past of 2015. But I think those are really interesting analytical questions in terms of, you know, what the actual information content of the data would be. And uh, it'd be a fun thing to explore with anywhere we can get longitudinal data, I think. I, I, that's an excellent point. I mean, the saturation of data and, uh, you know, versus the overwhelming collection of everything, which probably is not going to wind up being the solution over time. And it does, I think, get back to the, you know, I mean, we chatted a little bit uh, about this earlier that it, you know, in biology, we still don't, in medicine, we still don't know all the rules like, like they do in physics or even climatology where they have existing models. They project the big data on there. They know how to, you know, validate and invalidate. Whereas today, we don't really understand all the rules. Like we don't have the wisdom yet, and that's what we're trying to get towards. And maybe we're at this inflection point. But I think for that period of time, like bringing in more is better. Would be. Thank all you. right. So I think really two more questions <laughs> this time. So we'll go to the left and then to the right. And um. Excellent talk. I just wanted to uh, get your thoughts on sort of the concepts of maybe technology adherence, missing data on all these projects that are coming about, baseline, eHeart Health. Uh, we find it difficult to get people to adhere to medications that their lives depend on, and we're talking about adhering to technologies which uh, need recharging, variables that need to be taken off uh, every other day, and I'm just worried about what information we are getting and whether it is truly meaningful or is it what people want to give us. But you have to admit that projector one in the bathtub was pretty cool. Wasn't that cool? <laughs> I, I thought you'd like that. I, that. I brought that for you. <laughs> uh, the adherence thing is obviously a big one uh, with such a high proportion half of people not adherent. Um, but you know, when you think about it, uh, because almost 80% of the drugs are not effective in individuals, it's not nearly as bad a hit as, as, uh, as the pharma industry likes to project, I don't believe. Uh, so we, if we had drugs that really worked in people that were guaranteed to succeed, then adherence would become even more important. But there's ways to track that, and a watch is one start. I mean, if I don't, if I don't put in where it says, did you take or skip, if I don't put that in, it dings me on my watch. And I don't like to get dinged, so I put in, I took the medicine. And I try to be, that, that, that's the honor system, I guess, but there's also fancy ways to track pills. There are technologies that are coming about that I think will be better for adherence going forward, but our soft spot is really that the drugs are not too good. All right, thanks. So final question, make it a good one. All right. Uh, John Ambrose, social media director at Mount Sinai Health System. 
we have a couple questions from Twitter. Okay. And I'm happy to say we had over 250 tweets during this chat, so that's exciting. Nice. Um, and including uh, from Catherine Costa at um, MIT, she tweeted over 50 times, so that's impressive. <laughs> Is that somebody you pay, or? No. <laughs> no. I call that Twitter Rio, but uh, no, I, my, no offense, but that's a lot of tweets. So first question from Dr. Nick Jeans. He's a, a fantastic doctor here at uh, Mount Sinai. He asked, uh, do you think genomics and big data could raise health costs if patients respond hastily when seeing data that's best interpreted over time? Could it raise health costs? You're saying, is that the question? Yes, correct. Yeah, I mean, what we have is this trade-off of information, power, and then TMI, where it leads to, and that was actually the very first question, which is, you have a lot of information and you wind up doing more things, and there's always that liability. Uh, but, you know, I think we can, we can help on that. That is, there's a lot of decision support at the individual level that can tell people um, that uh, it's not indicated to do this or that and try to keep costs not so much constrained but, but evidence-based. So I, I think we have a solution for that that's part uh, technology and part consumer-based. Great. And the final question is from uh, Talia Swartz. She's a uh, infectious disease doctor at Mount Sinai. Uh, how do you foresee the future of insurance coverage for mobile devices for medical use? Uh, insurance coverage. For using mobile devices, uh, you mean like, for example, monitoring um, blood pressure or glucose? Correct. That kind of thing? Okay. Well, uh, it, if it turns out that outcome studies, which are going to be underway or, or will be, that show that um, you have better control of a chronic condition with less hospitalizations, emergency room visits, and you know all these different endpoints, then I think it, it will be very difficult for insurers not to support. Right now, though, one key point is that a lot of this technology outside of the glucose sensors, which I think are going to plummet in cost, but a lot of this technology is really inexpensive, so it's more consumer discretionary. When you have a Band-Aid that costs a dollar, instead of going to a sleep study that costs, reimbursed by Medicare, $3,500, I mean, and one's in your own bed, and one you're almost guaranteed to have some form of sleep apnea and sleep difficulty, which one would you take? And you're not worried about the, the reimbursement thing. But I do think that this, over the next few years, you're going to see a lot of validation trials. We're doing some that will help provide evidence that um, insurance would be wise to reimburse this path. We'll yeah, and I think there's already some examples. I mean, I, who's the uh, All Scripts guy? I just met with uh, Glenn Tolman who founded Livongo, where oh, they have yeah. the first FDA-approved two-way glucometer. And my understanding from them is they're already getting some reimbursement for in the type 1 diabetic community for using the app and device to better maintain control of the glucose. So. Right, right. Exactly. All right. Well, let's definitely thanks, Erica, thank once you. again thank for you. awesome, awesome talk. And thank you all for...